smaller upstarts. The gates were open, and no longer would NASA draw the map and give companies directions to follow. Now, the agency would provide the destination, and it was up to businesses to find out how to get there. The race was back on. Uh, a lot of late nights, a lot of early mornings, a lot of very stressful situations that we went through, but in the end, it was, it was all worth it. Laura Crabtree was part of the race at the ground level. She worked at SpaceX as a crew operations and resource engineer and was among those charged with answering NASA's call to take astronauts back to the International Space Station on board a U.S. craft. Over a period of nine years, what began as a competition among more than half a dozen firms came down to just two, SpaceX and Boeing. I think healthy competition is extremely good to keep people pushing boundaries. Um, without the competition with Boeing, I don't know if we would have all been as invigorated to get to the space station in 2020. Um, as you know, a lot of things happened in 2020, and there were a lot of hardships for each and every one of us during those times. And I personally put a lot of things on hold to get that mission to the space station that year. Um, if not for the competition, because we we thought at the time that we were both probably launching in 2020, and we just wanted to be first, and so we pushed really really hard to get there. In the end, of course, it paid off. In May of 2020, astronauts flew to the ISS on a craft built by a company that hadn't even existed when the space station first launched. We have Bob Bankin from SpaceX Demo 2 mission entering the International Space Station. The moment was symbolized by the recovery of a small American flag that had been left behind in the space station by some of the very same astronauts. A modern day version of that old game we played as kids called Capture the Flag. This is the uh, flag that we left uh, here almost nine years ago. And at some point after the uh, end of the shuttle program, we decided uh, we, had, we would have a little friendly competition to see who came up and got this flag. And uh, congratulations, SpaceX, you got the flag. I mean, there was a lot of relief. There was a lot of joy. All of us were up there sitting on the floor surrounding a couple of monitors that was at um, one of our cubicles and just waiting until they opened the hatch to get the flag that had been left by the last shuttle crew. As for Boeing, it would be four more years before it could get a crew to the space station. In fact, in the time it took for one crewed Boeing Starliner mission to reach the ISS, SpaceX sent up no fewer than nine crewed missions and they're doing it for far less money. The latest figures from NASA show the estimated average cost per astronaut for SpaceX was around $55 million. For Boeing, $90 million. And that's assuming things go according to plan, but they haven't. NASA has decided that Butch and Sonny will return with Crew-9 next February, uh, and that Starliner uh, will return uncrewed. Boeing Starliner couldn't complete its first mission, and in September it returned back to Earth without its crew. So to bring them back, NASA turned once again to SpaceX. What has been incredibly striking is just how much more rapid and more cost-effective and even more capable the private sector rocket industry is compared to the legacy government contractors and government itself like NASA and Boeing. So what has made SpaceX more successful than Boeing? There's no one answer, but at least part of it comes down to culture, to the way the company not only learns from failure, but cheers it on. this far into the test flight, the first integrated flight of the booster and the Starship vehicle. Starship just experienced what we call a rapid unscheduled disassembly or a run during ascent. But now this was a development test. This is the first test flight of Starship and the goal is to gather the data. And I think what's fascinating is how exemplified by SpaceX and Elon Musk is that they're willing to have rockets blow up in order to learn faster. And there's no question that it does, but I think that the culture of, say, a NASA or a large government contractor like Boeing 
would not exactly want to see their rockets blowing up on a pad to learn faster. And yet, it seems to be the case that that absolutely is the way that you can learn faster, make things cheaper, and iterate your designs much more rapidly. And if you look with uh, SpaceX's relationship with NASA, it's been very different than the traditional contractor model. Ron Epstein was an engineer for Boeing in the 1990s, and today he's managing director at Bank of America covering aerospace and defense. You know, the old model was, hey, we, we want this vehicle, here are all the specs, build it to this spec, we'll buy it. Where SpaceX has more of a watch it, build it, try it, fix it, build it, try it, fix it. I mean, you know, on social media, they, you know, the, their, you know, their rocket launches when they fail get a lot of airplay, but they learn a lot and they move forward. So what you see with the Falcon 9 landing itself, and who would imagine that, that 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 could happen? And they do it now on a regular basis, it's, it's almost boring now. You know, I say that tongue in cheek, and it's always fascinating to watch, but who would imagine you'd have rockets that could come back and land themselves very accurately? Well, SpaceX figured that out, build it, launch it, try it, break it, build it, launch it, try it, break it, and then you get there. Uh, and that's a very different mindset than the traditional, here's our spec, build it, deliver it, Ooh, it doesn't work, fix our spec, which turns out to be far more expensive, and I would argue probably doesn't get you there as quickly. For its